I became aware of Daniel's work about four or five years ago, and I've been watching him uh, without his awareness <laughs> in that time. And uh, I just got to a point where I had to make contact with, with Daniel. Uh, his works contain for me everything I seek in, in painting. Um, I mentioned in the, uh, the uh, press release, two of the things I personally seek in art are beauty and elegance. And beauty is, is not about being pretty, it's about honesty, it's about truth. It's a, it's a, a very large sort of concept. And elegance for me is when you can't add or subtract anything. It's absolutely perfectly resolved. These paintings contain those things. And in order to achieve that, there, of course, what's required is a mastery of technique and vision and all kinds of things. So anyway, I called Daniel and uh, we had a wonderful chat, uh, listening to this beautiful Scottish accent on the other end of the phone. And uh, we uh, decided to do some work together. <coughs> and, uh, the result has been this exhibition and I just could not be more happy with, with uh, having Daniel here. So, without anything further, I'd like to introduce Daniel. Daniel, are you still here? I was trying to run out of Daniel Mullen. Uh, and Daniel's here with his wife, Lucy, who is a part of Daniel's process, but I'm sure that um, And instead of an actual formal talk, Daniel thought the best way to do this would be more like a question and answer. So, um, I'm just going to turn the floor over to you. And, uh, yes. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. I'm very happy to be here and uh, share this work with you. Uh, first, it's from this, the synesthesia series with Lucy. Maybe Lucy, you'd like to come up. I'd like to. Yeah. Uh, so this is Lucy, and we make this work together. In, in the same. I'm getting a bit nervous. Oh. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you could start and then I'll Sure, yeah. So um, I have synesthesia, which is this different way of perceiving numbers and letters and color and time. And so when I first met Daniel, I saw he already was working in a painterly language that made me think he had synesthesia, but he didn't. Um, sad for him. <laughs> um, but I, I thought maybe he could help me realize visually what I experienced inside my own mind. And so we started working on a series pretty early on in our relationship that has really culminated for me in this work especially because this is a representation of all of the number digits in color that make up all other numbers. So, you know, every number is composed of zero to nine. And so these are all the colors of zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, with a little zero on the end. And this is a representation of decades. So um, you have, you know, ten, so through time, a century, the decades of a century. Um, but the question was about your process. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so um, um, when when the, the, the process, so basically I start the work, uh, so once we figure out what the colours are going to be and how we're going to set up the work, then uh, I start by drawing up the, the, the back lines and then I need to figure out what the perspective is and then I, when I know the perspective, so this one is different to all the rest in the fact that if you look at this one, all the, all the lines go into a vanishing point in the centre and then from there you, the work like fans out, all the segments are fanning out. With this one, if I would have taken the same process, then this line at the back that goes down, that would have ended up all the way over here, and the whole work would have been incredibly compressed in the center. So you wouldn't have been able to have all these uh, gradations. So each line in the back has its own uh, separate uh, vanishing point. As it, as it goes along, but then from, from standing back and seeing it, it feels like it all goes to one point. Um, so the, the work, so as Lucy said, the work starts on either side at zero. So each 
individual line accounts for one year in a decade. So there's five zeros here and five zeros there, and that makes up the, the, begin, the, the turn of the century, let's say. And then here you've got 10 lines of uh, a navy blue, which uh, represents uh, the 90s, for example. So in the, um, yeah, so maybe we'll go over here and look at this one. This one is a representation of um, not decades, but uh, the crossing of the, what we're talking about, this one. Uh, this is a different perspective. So with this one over here, where the perspective is that we're looking at time from above, so the, the decades passing from above, and this one we're actually looking at uh, two sections or two channels of time uh, from, uh, from the front. So you've got the, the orange, which is the six on one side, and then there's seven, which is the, the turquoise on the other. So this would be like, say, uh, the the thousandth line, and then that's the century line next to each other. And so if this would continue, you would have another one here, this would be the decades, and then another one would then be the individual years. Um, as a child, I had a very strong imagination. So I would go into a space, and I could look at the space, and the space would, I could, without the means around me, I could like, look at the space, and it would start to transform and change. And that was something that was very interesting to me, like uh, for my imagination, it really stimulated a lot of things. And as I was growing, getting older, that relationship changes. Like you, you, your your direct relationship with your imag imagination doesn't really exist anymore. You need to find other means. So for me, the canvas became that window into that relationship with my imagination. So um, I started painting space. Uh, the, the, I, I would start by photographing space that I thought was exciting. And exciting, I mean that it could go beyond what you're actually seeing, and it stimulated uh, and my imagination. So I would start photographing uh, architecture, and then going into the studio and painting it, and what I started to realize is that there was a lot of, uh, I was like, do I want to become an architect? Is that something that would be interesting to me? And then what I realized is there's a, no offense to any architects here, but there's a lot of things in the architecture that's got rather boring. Like figuring out where the, the, the pipes and the building are going to go. And there's so many things that are like kind of mundane personally to me. So I was like, oh, a lot of respect to architects. <laughs> like, so for, for me, I was like, all I'm interested in is looking at space and seeing how I can manipulate it and how it could transform and be multiple things at the same time. So. Uh, thinking like that, then I was looking at these photographs that I'd taken of architecture, and I also have to put something in, is I was really into brutalist architecture, and still am. Um, because the, in brutalist architecture, you, you have the, the way they construct the buildings is there's a lot of angles, and the way light, light falls on things, it like, looks like it could be something else, and it looks like it could be bigger and different. And it's not just like an apartment building, that can be very regular, repetition of the same shape, but it, Brussels architecture often has like very irregular things going on in it, which really stimulate the imagination. So I was taking uh, photos, translating them into paintings, and realizing that there's a lot of information that I actually want to leave out of the paintings. Um, so then I was starting to take away scale. And the reason that I didn't think scale was important for the work was that scale kind of births us, right? So it's, it's that we would really understand us in relationship to what we're seeing. So when you take away scale, then you're also taking away your physical relationship, and it becomes more of a cerebral relationship. And that, I thought, was interesting, especially using painting as the, the, the way to, to visually communicate. Because a, a painting is also like a window into another space, and then another realm. So I thought taking away scale would be a really good starting point for the work. And then taking away things like a light switch or anything that would like reference that. And then I start to think, yeah, but what is the what's the mental space that I'm creating for myself? Like do I need a, a an external stimuli in order for me to be able to create a space that could be a stimulant also for the viewer? And I kind of was through a, a process and I started to realize that maybe that's unnecessary. So I started to simplify the, the, the spaces down and the work became a lot more simple. And the reason that that was really important was because I wanted to only create a framework 
for communicating with the viewer. So if there's too much information, then I don't think I can really connect with the viewer. What I want the work to be is only, um, I, want it, I want the work to be a mirror for the viewer's own experience. Can you talk about how you create them? Um, so I use a lot of, um, the process of making the work is uh, starting to draw up uh, with pencil and then um, uh, I add, um, over the pencil layers I put uh, a layer of, uh, like for example with this one, uh, I put a layer of uh, acrylic paint and I use paper tape to, uh, uh, to like marcate the boundaries of the paint and then when that, all that's up then I start to bring on layers of a uh, very watered down uh, acrylic paint and then um, after that dries I add another one and one, another one and then slowly but surely that builds up the saturation of colour and then the, the white, for example, the white paint then starts to shine through but then with the yellow on top so then it kind of falls. Yeah. But there's a lot of paper tape involved. <laughs> <laughs> Would you uh, like to highlight any particular artists that you would see as influencing the style? Or your, your method? Um, but there's quite a there's a lot of different artists that have that I the different aspects of their work speak to me. But I'm I, I wouldn't say I'm trying to replicate any artists or anything like that. Nothing like that. But um, yeah, Mondrian for certain reasons. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Julie Moretu for other reasons, and um, she's an Ethiopian artist, mm -hmm. a lot of work. And uh, Donald Judd mm -hmm. for other reasons. Uh, there's, there's, there's a... Fair wife. Yeah, there's a fair wife. Mm -hmm. and, and Agnes Martin. Agnes Martin, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, yeah. She's quite special. Mm -hmm. Art, very special. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. And there's a lot. There's really a lot out there. It's hard to put the names on them. Yeah. But it's like with every artist, there's something. I think what it is is that we're each artist in their own ways, on their own path, searching for their own questions and answers. And with some artists, you can recognize a correlation with your own search. But then you know that because you are who you are, and you have the curiosity, you have to, you'll never make the same work. But there's something in them that makes a commonality. And that's something to then draw up on and say, okay, that's, that's a, a good approach that I can like, bring into my own work. Did you know anything of Joseph Kyle's work previous to meeting Paul? Or? <laughs> I actually didn't. I don't, yeah. But I've been, I've been honored to be able to see his collection that, uh, is standing behind these walls and it's kind quite of surreal, quite yeah. amazing, and also to see the relationships. Now I, I feel very connected to him, and there's some of his work that's just, yeah, I've I've learned a lot. I let's say since uh, being here, and I'm definitely going to take that into my practice. So I'm very excited. It's, yeah, and his process and Joseph Kyle, my father's process, very very similar. Um, you know, the process of the actual making of the work. And uh, also, I think, you know, one of the things I often say is, for me, I believe the single most important aspect of art is the act of art. It's when the artist is involved in that process of making art, when, uh, at the risk of sounding corny, in a sense, it's when we're closer to God than any other time. The ego is completely not a factor, uh, as the emotions are. There's, um, and that uh, art I know, is born out of necessity. An artist has to make art like we have to breathe. It's not a, it's not a, a, a choice. And I know with my father, and I know, also know with Daniel, that both of them had that very strong necessity and the process in talking and listening to Daniel talk over the last several days we've been spending time. Uh, that's ultimately the aspiration, of course, is that sense of going into that place where the divine exists within us. And, you know, and 
I do believe that art is one of the few physical manifestations of the existence of that within us. And uh, Daniel, Daniel's work really, really uh, demonstrates that for me as a So there's a, a very definite relationship between yours and my father. It's yeah. really beautiful to see that for me. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's great to be that. Great to see that, to explore that relationship. Um, the ones without red dots are still for sale. <laughs> <laughs> Don't miss up. <laughs>